Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. I'm your host, Roger Kinect, President of Universal Accounting Center, and each and every week we have on the show guests, experts in their own right to actually help us work on our businesses and build, in fact, the premier accounting firms in our area. This is going to be a wonderful episode. It's something I've been looking forward to because we have on the show Lauren Norton. He happens to be the bottleneck coach. He works with entrepreneurs and gets them unstuck when they become bottlenecked in their own business. In fact, entrepreneurs can become bottlenecked in many ways, but the price they pay is always the same. They're stuck regardless of the industry they operate in. He happens to be a French national who left France at the age of 23 and spent 20 years in Southeast Asia before relocating to Finland in the summer of 2019. His professional background is in marketing research and advertising, where he ran a small business of up to 150 people across three countries. So, Lauren, welcome to the show. Hello, Roger. Thank you very much for having me. This is going to be a pleasure. Why? Because you talk about entrepreneurship, and clearly, as we are operating, running our businesses as bookkeepers, accountants, tax preparers, we're clearly entrepreneurs. And one of the phrases yes. I always use is that of an account entrepreneur. It's the marriaging of, of the accounting profession with the skills and principles of being an entrepreneur. So let's talk about being an entrepreneur. Why is this something that you're so passionate about? Ha. First, I didn't know about this, uh, this, uh, this term. Um, but that's, 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 that's a good one. Um, I mean, I don't know. I feel like entrepreneurship is a calling. Uh, not I feel, I believe entrepreneurship is, is a calling. And, but sometimes it just takes a little bit of, uh, and it's not to nurture uh, within people. And in my case, it took me 18 years. And it all started when I went to uh, Asia. I left France at, at the age of 23, started working for this small research agency. And a year after, they just gave me the keys of the company. And they said, well, it was a small company of 10 people. And they said, we're going to move to Cambodia. There are more opportunities. I was in Laos, a very, very small country. But we need someone to run the business. And it's going to be you. <laughs> because we don't have any other choice, basically. Uh -huh. so, so they gave me the keys. And I loved it from day one. I mean, and, and, and since I've always been uh, running businesses, for for others like they like they were mine, I've always also at the same time been surrounded by entrepreneurs. Like my best friend is is an entrepreneur. Uh, I we we did some work together actually. Uh, there have a lot. There are a lot of people around me who have been entrepreneurs. My mentors, all my mentors have been entrepreneurs. My father used to be an entrepreneur. His his father used to be an an entrepreneur. And you know when I reached the age of uh, of forty. I was like, you know, it's it's time that I do something. I it's either I do it now or I will never start my own journey. And so this this passion about entrepreneurship just just grew up in me just like that. And because I was working, I was working with, I was surrounded by entrepreneurs. I was working for entrepreneurs. You know, the kind of which they, they like I said, they give you the keys, but they don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> so you have you have to hey, do whatever you can. I think that entrepreneurial mindset grew grew in me, and 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 I I speak the language. It, entrepreneurs make sense to me, and this is basically how it happened. So I like the fact that you first of all pointed out how you were surrounded by individuals who were entrepreneurs, that they were yes. individuals you were associating with, interacting with, that you were observing, being mentored by. And I can relate to that because right now in my life, I'm fortunate enough that I've put together a group of friends with whom I associate on a regular basis who are also entrepreneurs, who are yeah. God-fearing men that are individuals that I want to aspire to be like. And as I'm trying to emulate them, one of the things I do keep in the back of my mind is that we there's a phrase out there that suggests we are the sum total of the five people we spend the most time with. Yes. And uh, what I'd like to believe is that I'm kind of in the middle. I've got a few people that are doing better <laughs> than me that kind of motivate me to do better. I've got a few people that are a little bit behind me so that I can be more inspired to be a better person to kind of help them and uh, serve. So right in that mindset, I think, I think we can all be in the position of bettering ourselves. So mm. can anyone be an entrepreneur? Uh, I'm going to tell you, no, it's, it's not for, for everybody. Um, because first it's, like I said, it's a calling it's, it's, it, you have it in you or you don't. And there's no, there's no in between. 
right? So if you ask yourself the question, am I an entrepreneur? Well, the answer should be a strong yes. There shouldn't be any, any hesitation, right? And here it's very important that I, that I, that I talk about, that I differentiate between uh, the type of entrepreneurs I'm talking about versus the mom and pop shops. Okay. Like you can find, like you can find in Southeast Asia, because those guys, they, they in Asia, for instance, they don't have like a, a strong social uh, security support system, right? So they have, they have to have, uh, they have to make a living, uh, in addition to their work, so, so, so that they can, they can uh, support each other, and most of the time they're gonna, they're gonna end up like having this mom and pop shop, right? Now. We where we live where we live in more uh, developed countries with the privilege of being 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 in such such countries, uh, being an entrepreneur, like I said, is really something like like you have no choice because let's be honest, you could do something else and and earn a lot more money. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and so it requires the right mindset, and that is the second thing that is really really important. And that's why it's not for everybody. Because entrepreneurship starts and ends in your head, first and foremost. The difference between the great entrepreneurs versus the, the good entrepreneurs, I th- strongly believe it's in the head. It's between your ears. Okay. It's, it's, you know, that resilience, that grit, that capacity you have to stand back up and continue versus adversity. Because you're going to fail, you're going to fall down so many times. You're going to have, uh, you know, the doors closing on you so many times. You're going to hear no all the time. But you have to be, you have to be like ready to go through all the walls, one after the other. And I would say also, it's not for everyone because being an entrepreneur, and this is actually this is actually one of uh, one of the one of the bottlenecks, or one of the solutions to tackling a, on a, a bottleneck is entrepreneurs. They are driven by impact. What does that mean? Impact means they want to change the world. So they have purpose. Yes, pu- yes, purpose. Yes, but the purpose often comes later. The impact is more about like, I want to change the world and my action will impact the world. And because of my action, I will impact the world in a good, in a good way. Right? So, and often it is related to helping people. Interesting. You know, one of the things that I'm liking about this is earlier you brought up how in Asia you saw an individual that was actually running kind of a family business and yes. uh, working from their home, for example. I'm going to yes. complement that with the fact that when I was in South America, I saw something very, very similar in society that I don't see too often in Western cultures, which is so many of the home or so many of the businesses actually had homes behind them, and the individuals yes. worked more or less 24 seven. And so, Absolutely. it was a little shop, or maybe it was the tailor, or it was the 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 uh, butcher their business was out front and you could come to them at six in the morning. You could come to them at 10 o'clock at night. You could come to them, uh, you know, Monday through uh, Sunday through Saturday. And why? Because their home was just behind the store and they were able to walk to the front and answer whatever doorbell or ring there was. And they would, you know, service you as a customer. But to your point, yes, they're entrepreneurs, but it's more of a job. And it's at a very basic level in the sense that they're just providing for their family. And what we're talking about now is where they take it up a notch because we're not talking about just performing tasks to live and go day to day. We're talking about being that entrepreneur that's driven to actually do more than just what they're capable of doing and hiring employees and being like you're describing someone that's on a mission. Because I do believe that there's an evolution that goes from the job status of a business owner to that of a lifestyle. You're more passionate, you're more driven, you have purpose, and all of a sudden you've got this thing where you're trying to make the world a better place because you believe your product or service is in fact that much better than they can get from the competition. You make that big of a difference for your clients. How's this sounding to you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You you summarized that very, very well, better, better than me, better than I explained. And I and I would add on top of that is you have also you have to be ready also to make a lot of sacrifices. Yes, right. Because 
you know, it's, it's, it's like, I like to compare being an entrepreneur to being a professional athlete, uh-huh. right? Professional athlete, we all understand they have to make sacrifices. You know, they don't, for instance, on, the, on their diet, on the fact that maybe they don't have a social life, on uh, the fact that, you know, instead of, instead of uh, uh, going out on the evening, they have to go to sleep because the next day, the next day they have a, a big competition. It's a bit the same with, uh, with entrepreneurs. There's going to be a lot of sacrifices. Sacrifices on your family, because work will come first. Sacrifices on the money, because at the beginning of the day, you know, you don't earn any money. Most of the time, I mean, it's 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 common that you don't make any any money. It takes time before you are able to make a salary for yourself. But sacrifices also because uh, you you won't go with friends because you have to work, uh, or you decide, or you have this very important, uh, you know, meeting or whatever whatever it is to do to finish. So instead of going and have a, and have a blast with your friend, well, you're going to be stuck at work, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again. That's not everybody is ready to make those type of sacrifices. You know, I'm gl- grateful you brought up sacrifice because it's something that I, I experience quite often, not only running the business, but as I interact with other business owners, yeah. because I, I'm going to add two things here. One, your analogy to that of a professional, it does take sacrifice. You're, do, you're willing to do something that everyone else isn't willing to do to be the best. And because of that, you're willing to stay the longer hours. You're willing to do go the extra mile, do the things that no one else would do. I'd like to make it akin to with success, sacrifices have been made. Now, here's where I'm going with this. Recognizing that success dem- demands sacrifice, there's a lot of times a conversation that takes place within business as to our desire to have balance. The, they'll bring up the phrase of work-life balance, typically. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not a proponent of balance. I don't believe the word is a, an appropriate term for this discussion. But nonetheless, I'm going to bring it up to say, how does someone balance the need for sacrifice to be successful with the fact that they have other things that are going on other than the yeah. business in their lives? They have relationships, they have family, they've got hobbies, they've got other interests. We are well-rounded individuals and we have other needs. How do you address that with the entrepreneur when it does take sacrifice, especially to start the business to be successful? Yeah, it's a great it's a great point. And the problem is most entrepreneurs, they sacrifice too much. It's mm. all work, 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 yeah. work. You know, grinding, 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 because that's all they know. This is what this is what they this is this, this is their baby. So they put all their tears, their sweat, everything into it. We're good at the hustle. Yeah, <laughs> we're very, very, very good at that. And the problem is that over the long term, medium to long term, it will affect your health, uh-huh. both your mental health and your physical health. I mean, how long can you sustain such a pace? It's no wonder that entrepreneurs get exhausted, entrepreneurs burn out. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I interviewed a, a, a guest on my podcast who did a burnout and he told me that at that point he was ready to give his business for free. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> give it away to the first person who will come because he was so exhausted. And so it's really important that we teach to entrepreneurs, especially the importance of self-care. How can you take care of your business, your people, your family, you know, your relationships, if you don't take care of yourself. It's not possible. And if we, and again, if we go back to what, uh, if we compare again to profet- being a professional athlete, again, I believe that there's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, there's a big analogy between, between both worlds. Because entrepreneurship is the race of your life, right? So how do you, as a professional athlete, prepare for the race of your life? Yes. And Well, professional athletes, they do understand the importance of recovery. Rest and recovery. Not only the physical recovery, because they know that when you rest, your muscles actually grow, but also the mental recovery. Because they know it's a mental game. Like I said at the beginning, entrepreneurship is first and foremost about your mindset. It's a mental game. You need to have the, 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 the mental fitness 
to be an entrepreneur. And that's why you can't have so all the time. I hope you're not going to ask us to get into an ice bath. I <laughs> okay, you should. <laughs> well, here's what it's I fantastic. like. Here's what I love about this. When you take it into a an athletic discussion, athletes, yes. one of the things that they've proven is they can be very effective mentally going through the motions of what their task is, as well as it is doing the muscle memory associated with the task. So if, here, one example I remember in a study was that of basketball. They took basically half of the individuals and said, okay, what we want you to do is mentally imagine yourself shooting the ball into the hoop and yes. just go through the motions mentally versus the individuals who actually went onto the court and from the court practiced doing that. And they found that they were equally as effective to the the uh, uh, other group that didn't practice either mentally or physically. So there was definitely a, a noticeable benefit by just mentally going through that exercise. Mm -hmm. And I think as entrepreneurs, we're very good at living our business 24 seven and we're thinking about, about it all of the time. And I think that's one of the things that's passionate for us. But I'm gonna go back to a, a comment you made a moment ago regarding how others are dependent upon us. Their, their, our customers, our employees, they look at us and they derive their energy from us. So yes. what my point is, is I've illustrated this a number of times in, in uh, presentations as if we are the energizer bunny. So when we walk into the room, whether it's with our potential customers, our current customers, our employees, they're immediately going to look to us and from the energy we bring into the room, determine what's going on. If we're passionate, excited, if we're bringing this positive energy in, they're going to be drawn to it and they're going to be energized by it. But if we're coming in frustrated, angry, upset, if we're coming in as if the world is weighing down on us, down on us, they're going to notice and they're going to know, okay, we need to avoid Roger. Roger's obviously in a bad mood. Something's Absolutely. wrong. And so all of a sudden, what, what we're not recognizing is entrepreneurs, we have this effect on our surroundings. We impact and really influence influence everything around us from our customers, potential customers, employees, just by how we come into the room. And so often I think we're in that positive mindset, which is why we're successful. We're drawing these people to us. But too often, I think we find ourselves in situations where we can be the negative and perhaps don't even recognize what we're doing. How does that sound? It sounds like being the bottleneck. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. So define the bottleneck. But let me. Let me. I oh, want, I want to ahead. add something. Something on 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 success because I think also it's it's really important and we don't spend enough time. Entrepreneurs don't spend time at all on the definition of success. If you look, if you look at the media, the media talking about entrepreneurship. Who do they talk about? The big ones, right? The Elon Musk, the Jeff Bezos, and all the ones that have made it. But they never talk about all the thousands and thousands and thousands of the others who didn't make it, or they made it, but not at the level of the big ones. And still they're happy. They might be even happier than the big ones. And I think as an entrepreneur, it's really important and yeah, it's, it's still linked to the mental fitness. It's really important that you spend time defining what success is to you. Because if I ask you to define what is success, you can go everywhere, right? You can, you can, you can take what you see in the media. You can take what you hear from others. But if I ask you what is success for you, then you start being a bit more personal. And my success, the definition of success for me, might be very well different from the definition of success for you. And then you should shape that definition into your entrepreneurial journey. So for instance, I'm going to take my example. This is the best example I know. Okay. I do not want to build an empire. I am a solopreneur. Well, I don't like the the the, the solopreneur uh, fight because I, I I do I do and do employ like a virtual assistant, so I am not alone. But I don't want to multi, I don't want to build a bigger company. I don't want the, the company to go beyond myself. Because what I want is I want to have great conversations, great conversation co coaching conversations. Sorry, with great clients who I'm going to coach maybe for life. I want to have the space in my mind to be able to do that, which is why I only offer high ticket sales, right? 
Mm-hmm. I don't put people into a packaging because I don't believe I don't believe in it. So I don't do anything like like a cheap offer, 30, 30, 30 day or sixty day. You know, come into my uh, coaching package. Everybody everybody gets the same the same uh, coaching approach, etc. I don't do that at all. But this is the choice I made because this is success for me. I want to enjoy my life. You were talking about earlier about how entrepreneurship is a lifestyle. Well, this this is a lifestyle for me. I want to define my lifestyle as being able to enjoy my life, being present, mm-hmm. being because because I used to go from one peak to another. I used to do that, grind, grind, grind. I did that, hustle, hustle, hustle. I burn out, so I don't want to do that anymore. I want I want to pause. I want to take the time. I want to service my clients. And if I am able to do that, of course, I do have some financial um, figure in mind. And hopefully I will reach those. But if I'm able to do that and live a comfortable life, that is success for me. You know, I'm liking this because it's clearly that we each have our own definitions of what success is. And there's not a right or wrong answer to this. And I think that's very important because sometimes what I believe we do is we compare too much in our society as to what the other person has achieved. And we wonder why haven't we done that? Or should I try more? When in reality, you should be happy. Uh, Tony Robbins once had an interview where he was speaking with a gentleman and he shared this, this insight that really resonated with me. Tony Robbins indicated that he was talking to a client and the client defined success of when he had a million dollars liquid cash in the bank account. Mm. And uh, Tony was uh, very uh, astute to basically draw this point out. He was talking to the client saying, okay, so you're, you're letting this physical arbitrary number of, of money in the bank determine whether or not you're happy when today you have a wonderful family, you've got success going on in business, your health is wonderful, and yet mm-hmm. you're saying you won't be happy until you have a million dollars in the bank, liquid cash. And I think Tony was smart to point out to this individual that he has every right to be happy today. And by, if he chose by his own definition, he could choose that he is a success, but this individual was putting out there this, this other thing that was impeding his ability to be happy in the moment. So I'm not to say we don't need to have things that we're striving for. I'm not proposing that we take things that are our dreams and take them off the shelves and throw them away. But but what I am saying is like you indicated earlier, are you living in the moment? Are you present? Are you able to be happy today? And are you able to be uh, aware of the abundance that you're experiencing in life and be grateful for it? And I believe if we're able to each in our own be successful in the moment and work towards even a better self, that that's wonderful because we're not in competition with anyone else. This isn't a no. competition is to say, until I'm like Bezos and have a yacht and have a uh, uh, a younger woman on my shoulder, am I going to be happy? No, I, I think there's a better way to define success. And personally, just to add to your explanation, one of the things that I was taught younger and I su- subscribe to is a quote that I was given that says, no, fel- or no success can compensate for failure in the home. So I'm, I'm very much a family man. I'm very much a God-fearing person that believes that if I can focus on my family, I, fi- I will find happiness not only today, but in the end of my life. And that's one of the things that's very important. So I work to live and with that context, try to be successful. So a lot of little nuggets in here. What would you add to that? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a quote then, if we're in two quotes. One of my favorite is, we, only, we all have two lives. The second one, starts when we realize we only have one. Mm. Very I'll let good. You think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. Okay. <laughs> it is so it is so true. So you know Gandhi Gandhi said be the change you want to see. You want you want be the change you want to be in the world. Be the, be the change sorry you want to see in the world. Yes, yes. It's up to you. It's up to you. Absolutely. If it's meant to be it's up to me. There you go. All right, yeah. so here's a thought. What's the biggest risk that entrepreneurs are facing then? Well, being the bottleneck in the business. <laughs> That's what I really believe. I think, you know, we all, uh, there's a lot of uh, articles and, and, and uh, talk about, you know, how marketing is important or finance is important. And I'm, I know I'm talking, I'm talking to, uh, to our content and people working in the finance sector. Yes, all of that is super important. But, but, the biggest risk you face is you, the funder. We are our worst 
enemies. And I think this is what we were trying to prove <laughs> until, until, until now, right? I'm, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you an example of the the most common bottleneck that I know. Okay. Which come, which is the lack of delegation. This is the biggest one. It happens most of the time because entrepreneurs, when the company grows, right, you 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 know that you can't do everything, so you need to start delegating stuff mm -hmm. to others. That's right. Right. But why wouldn't you do it? Have you ever faced that? Have oh, yes. you ever faced that? So why didn't you delegate? Most of the clients that I've worked with and I've even experienced myself is the first question, especially coming from a solopreneur point of view, is when the business makes money, you're equated to the business, therefore you're making money. And so as you hire someone, the first uh, implication is, is I'm making less money because I'm splitting yes. what the company is earning between now me and someone else. And so- yes. In, unless they're a revenue producing person, you're running the risk of just w working the same amount of time and perhaps while you're training, even working a little bit more to train the individual while making less because you're now having Absolutely. to split the earnings of the company with two people. Yeah. So you see hiring someone as a cost. That's right. Rather than seeing it as an investment. Yes. It's like, it's like uh, the people saying, oh, I don't want to train the staff because they're going to leave me. Uh -huh. yeah, but what if you were training the staff and they were staying? Have you thought about that? Mm -hmm. And so that is a perception. This is your self-limited uh, belief. That's what you believe, that if I hire someone, it's going to become a cost. Okay, but you could also choose to believe that if you hire someone, that person will become actually an investment and will enable you to make even more money. So the way I address it with my clients is I always say, if I could hire someone that can take on non-revenue producing activities that are distracting me from revenue producing activities, I'll be able to produce more because I'm not distracted by these other tasks. So therefore, Absolutely. I'm in a position where I'm freeing myself up to sell more, generate more revenue. And that's one way to look at it. The other is to hire an individual who, like me, is a revenue-producing individual. Therefore, there's an ROI to their employment. And I can directly tie production to revenue that they're, that they're doing. Either way, it's a win-win. Because either Absolutely. I'm hiring somebody that is a revenue-producing person, or I'm hiring someone that is lib that's freeing me up, liberating me, such that I can be more productive and profitable. Absolutely. And you use the word liberate. liberate. Mm -hmm. Libertad. That's, that's, this, is, this is what it is about. The tactics to tackle the bottlenecks, there are many. That's the easy part. The most difficult part is here in your brain. It's to recognize that you are the bottleneck, that the fact that you are not hiring someone and hence you continue maybe complaining about the fact that how much you are exhausted is just because you have decided that you will look at that high as a cost rather than an investment allowing you to do something else. You know, I'm really loving this because the analogy I always give is I think we need to take off the glasses we're wearing where we're pessimistic, where we're looking yeah. at things in a negative well, we're light. We're very good at that. And we want to take those glasses, <laughs> take them off, put them down, put on the glasses of abundance, of optimism, yeah. of basically I'm going to make this happen and work. And it's not to be blinded by the fact that life isn't uh, difficult because it is difficult and it will throw curveballs at you. But the point is, is I'm choosing to move forward as if I can move through it. I, I love the phrase, this too shall pass as it relates to challenges mm -hmm. we face. And so the older I get, the more I realize that time does speedily go by. And if I am perseverant, I know that I can come out on the other side, not only yeah. better because I've learned from the experience, but better because I think the situation will be better. And it's not always true, but it is how I choose to live my life and make the decisions I make, believing that I'm moving in the right direction. Absolutely. And if I can add on top of that, mm -hmm. is most of the time, we're not even honest with ourselves. Because I am pretty sure that the answers that they give you, that your clients give you, are not the right ones. You should never believe what the, what the clients say, <laughs> the first thing that the clients say. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Okay. 
I was I was uh, coaching a, a client. It was an, an architect that was back when I was living in Cambodia, and he was he was telling me I want to grow the business, but I realized that uh, if I want to grow the business, I need to have a I need to remove myself and 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 you know put myself in and, and focus on finding new clients, etc. Right? Or be a more more business development, more planning. Yep. But I really love client management. So I'm involved with all clients because I love it. And that's the first thing he told me. But me being a coach, I didn't stop there. <laughs> I said, all right, tell me, tell me a bit more. And we started digging. And it turned out that the reason why he didn't want to let go of client management was not because he was loving client management. It was because he was afraid that if we, if we, if he was if you had to let go of the client management aspect and hire someone else to take care of the clients, he was afraid that the quality standards would decrease. So you see, from love to fear. And that's the thing is that most of the time, we don't do things because we are afraid. So what did we do together with the clients? We worked on a shift in the perspective, a shift in the mindset. Same as what I was talking, I was, I was uh, pointing out to you. It's all right, but what if you hire someone who is actually better than you at client management and will take the uh, quality standards to the next level where you were not able to do? How does it sound? And that's what it takes. So that's why most of the time we're not even honest with ourselves because we are telling, telling all these stories to ourselves, you know, keeping ourselves into our, into our own like comfortable box uh -huh. because we are afraid. The truth is that we are afraid. Most of the time people don't hire, don't delegate because they are afraid. They are afraid of losing quality control. They are afraid of hiring someone they don't know about. You know, they are, they are afraid that it will take time uh, and, and it may not work and they're going to have to spend waste time into, you know, training them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all those fears that come from your limited beliefs. Yes, yes. So I'm curious, what can entrepreneurs do then to tackle these bottlenecks that you're describing, the fear that you've mentioned? Yeah, but the first thing is they have to recognize they are the bottleneck. And that's the most... That's the self self awareness is is the most important aspect. That's why again it's a mental game. You, they have to build their emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is about learning to uh, un understand your emotions, so that you are able to manage them, and also you can manage other people's emotions. So are there any skills that an entrepreneur should learn to help address this? Well, there are, there are, there are many, um, I used, I, I like for myself, I like, I like to use two, uh, journaling is a, is a big one Yeah. because it allows you to go deep inside you. Self-reflective. So Self-reflection. Self -reflection, yes. You start, you start from something that bother you and you start writing why it bothers you and go deeper and deeper and deeper until you touch the real issue and then you come back and writing with a pen and paper has this, that, has that ability to let you, to let you like self-reflect really, really deep. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's some sort of, uh, it's a form of, of meditation. Okay. The other thing when it comes, when it comes to, uh, uh, uh emotional intelligence is being, uh, starting listening to your body. Because for every emotion, there is like a physical reaction. And sometimes the physical, there's a physical trigger sometimes to the emotion. And we don't, it's, it's so fast that we don't even realize it sometimes. And so being more aware means listen to your body a bit more. What's, go, what's going on in you? To give you an example, when I get angry, I know that it starts in my gut and it goes all the way up to my face and I know I'm, I feel my face is like really warm, super hot. And then he goes, and then words go out of my mouth. 
as soon as the words go out of my mouth, it's over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't stop it. I just can't stop it. The problem is I, I, I hear myself talking. I really don't like it. I despise myself in those moments, but I just can't stop it. So by being aware of what's going on in my guts, I can do something before, like a physical act, just maybe like, you know, standing up, getting out of the room, if I'm talking to someone, so that I don't get angry. Another, another one which may, uh, which may actually be more relevant to your audience is that the, the, the imposter syndrome, you know, that voice uh -huh. that is uh, talking in your head all yeah. the time. Yep. I realized that what's happening is that when my, that voice is talking to me, that the, the imposter syndrome kicks in, I tend to, uh, uh, you know, clamp on myself, like close on myself, like a, like a clamp, right? Like, like I want to go back into a fetish position. Okay. So as soon as I realize that, the only thing and very simple thing that I have to do if I'm sitting is I just have to straighten up, put my shoulders back, and that's it. The voice is suddenly quiet. It does not disappear. It will never disappear. But I am not listening to it. So it's quiet in my, in my, in my head. So that's, that's two of the techniques people can do to build, can use to build emotional intelligence. And that will help them realize when they, are, when they are the bottleneck. The other technique is listening. Speak less, listen more. We are so good at speaking. Like I'm be, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> But as a, coach, as a coach, I usually listen a lot, a lot more. Listen to what other people tell you. People in your team, people around you, they will, when you become the bottleneck, they will tell you. And if you can listen, if you can listen, and we all have the ability to listen, but can you really listen? You will hear what they say. And perhaps you will act upon it, especially if more, if several people are saying the same things, the same thing to you. Interesting. Well, one of the things that I really appreciated you mentioning is not only the journaling, the journaling is very good. I, I really suggest what are called gratitude journals. I think that's mm -hmm. something that keeps you in the right mindset. So I'll compliment what you shared with that. But the physical, the fact that you said physically stand up, put your shoulders back. I'm a big proponent in exercise and I used to do yeah. it a lot more than I currently do it now. Um, I'm back on a routine. Uh, fortunately, that is as much as I can uh, five days a week, and I really enjoy it. But the point that I want to make re regarding exercise is, first of all, I do believe that it does give my, gives my body the health it needs to sustain the stresses I'm putting on it physically and mentally. Um, I really do enjoy the exercise I do because it forces me to get out of the house, get out of the office, and go someplace where I can exercise But the thing is, is I feel so much better and I'm Absolutely. grateful that I've put the time into it. And I'm, I'm not to the point that I'm an athlete and I'm eating right and exercising correctly as if I'm professionally in that direction, but at least I'm taking care of this shell that my soul exists in and I'm doing a little bit better than Absolutely. I perhaps Absolutely. would if I was just sitting around working hunched over on my computer all day long which as a workaholic is my tendency. I just, you know, I, I just yeah. sit down and go to work and before I know it, eight, 10 hours have gone by and, I, and I'm happy, but, and, and I'm productive, but clearly that's not only who I am. So I've got to be yeah. more mindful of my physical being and take care of this shell that I'm within. So um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wrap this up. I really think this conversation has been phenomenal and I'm going to come back to you for a closing thought. But before I go, I'd like to invite the listeners to actually take advantage of some special offerings that are available today in the episode description. Lauren is making available some very great offers here that I'd like you to take advantage of. First of all, he has an ebook called Thrive, Eight Essential Tactics to Excel as an Entrepreneur and Propel Your Business Forward. It's an ebook that you want to take advantage of. And I want you to get this because it's eight practical tactics that you can actually use in your business. He also has the bottleneck index. It's an accurate tool to identify, understand, and overcome existing and potential business bottlenecks. So you'll definitely want to take advantage of the index that's available in the episode description. And then lastly, he has a free impact assessment call that he's willing to offer to you and uh, give you an opportunity to speak with him so that you can tackle your bottlenecks as you may find them. So if you're interested in not only getting the uh, the eight essential tactics to excel, 
the bottleneck index and this uh, assessment, definitely go to the episode description and take advantage of those. In addition, I'm going to point out that we also have in here one that I would highly recommend that you actually take advantage of, and it is in the episode description, and it's your business score. The business score is what you can do to actually identify the eight drivers that determine the value of your business, and it's in here. It's more or less going to be doing a self-assessment of your company. And just like you would do a SWOT analysis, it's going to do a strengths analysis of your business to identify what are those areas that need attention and allow you to then work on them so as to increase the valuation of your business, which is perhaps one of the greater assets that you in fact have. So definitely go to the episode description, look for the business score and those other items and take advantage of those today. As a summary of our conversation, this has been perfect. I really do feel <laughs> that as entrepreneurs, we don't give credit where it's due. We are a unique breed. We are an individual that uh, really kind of thrives where others fail. And one of the things that we do is we do push ourselves, we propel ourselves forward. And uh, the challenges that we face, I, I think some of them are ones that, uh, if I dare say we enjoy, we grow from and we're better because of it. And I think as entrepreneurs, we need to recognize that it does take a lot for us to do this. That's why sacrifice was mentioned at the beginning. From sacrifice, we are able to achieve the things that we're experiencing. So there are things that we do give up, uh, whether it's time, activities, but there's also freedom that comes from being an entrepreneur. After we've paid the price, I think there's a lot of good that comes on the backside where we are a little bit more free and able to do a lot of things that we would like to do because we can define our success as was described earlier. We can define our success as to the hours we want to work, the things and activities we want to do, the people with whom we get to work. There's a lot of latitude that comes our way being entrepreneurs as we define our business. And whether it's a small business as a solopreneur or that or building an empire as we were describing, we get to define what that is, how we're going to build it, where we're going to take it. And one of the things that was helpful is at the beginning, we were talking about, we're passionate about what impact we're having in the world, how we're making a change, how we're the difference. And I really do feel that once we can identify our purpose and identify what it is that we're doing that's so unique that our customers are willing to pay for it, we can become that much more emboldened and moving towards success. So I really do like this conversation because it allows us to identify what are the sacrifices we're making, what are some of the bottlenecks that we're uh, basically experiencing that are holding us back, and how can we address those. And one of the things that I really appreciated towards the end was the idea that what we can do is, first of all, recognize that we can be gracious with what we've experienced and been blessed with. So having a journal where we can write things through and get to the fears of what's holding us back and perhaps add to that the things that we're grateful for. And then in addition, the value of putting our shoulders high, standing up, facing the challenges that we're facing and being a little bit more emboldened and not listening to that voice that sometimes breaks in as the imposter syndrome kind of may uh, overwhelm us. We, we are in a position where we can definitely address that. So with all that being said, Lauren, what would you like to add to this? Man, you're excellent at summarizing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I listen. I listen. Wow. Well, yes. Okay. You listen, but you do also have the ability to summarize, which I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what's your what's your final statement then? <laughs> uh, I would say your closing you know, thought. Uh, closing thought. I think I think what comes to my mind right now is to remind people that it's it's the entrepreneurial journey starts and, end, and ends with them first and foremost. You know, we you can never control the outcomes, really, but you can definitely control how you react. And the, you, you you can control to the maximum what what the the the, the way the actions you're gonna put you're gonna put in place, right? Sometimes you don't get to the outcomes that you wish, and that's that's life, you know, because maybe a COVID pandemic will happen will happen again, and then that you have con no zero control over. But everything else is in is in your control. So remember. That when you face a situation, start by assessing you. What's going on with you? Because most of the time, the answers is or you already have the answer. You just need to go deep down sometimes to find it. This is beautiful. I really appreciate that. That's an excellent place to end. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to invite all of my listeners. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast. We'd love to have you as a subscriber so that we can notify you each and every week of the new episodes that come out. Obviously, we have uh, one new episode every week, but I want to invite you to go to universalaccounting.com and find there in the navigation 
the podcast playlist. We have some highlights that we've put together that you can go and listen to, binge listen to those various needs that you have as they may relate to marketing, selling, pricing, uh, mental health, client onboarding, tech stacks, just the variety of topics that you might find valuable that you are actually needing to address right now in your business. Go there and listen to those uh, playlists, binge listen to those and hear from the experts. I also want to invite you to GrowCon. GrowCon is an annual conference where we actually have the experts on stage for us to actually work on our businesses. It's here that you can actually register and join us for GrowCon. In the event, we're going to have on stage the experts, but we also get a visit with the peers, those people like you and I that are actually out there working so that we can collaborate, work on our businesses, and really help one another as we're taking care of our clients. And then lastly, you get to meet the staff of Universal Accounting, those individuals that are committed to helping you be in business for yourself, but not by yourself with Universal. So definitely, if you haven't registered as of yet, I look forward to seeing you there. Get your ticket and join me for GrowCon. The next thing I'd like to point out is regarding regarding this podcast, if you have any questions or would like to discuss more of the principles that are brought up, definitely reach out to us. You can reach us at universalaccountingschool.com or you can give us a phone call at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care and be safe out there.